I think we're online? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, uh, this is the talk of Ally, area rules to use or not to use. So, if you're looking for a different talk, this isn't your room. I guess we're on. Yep. All right. So, All right. You, we do have the slides available if you want to go and take oh, a look and take, download them. We wrote the, uh, Charles wrote the URL over there on the board, but of course, get them here. Yes. All right. Uh, my name is Susan Laurent. I work as a web manager over in the College of Education at UT Austin. Uh, I've been involved with accessibility for quite some time now. Um, John Slayton actually introduced me to it back in the day, and uh, I've certainly have appreciated the lessons that he imparted, and uh, strive to stay true to his spirit. Uh, my name is Charles Overton. I like to say I'm forever new. Oh um, yeah, ditto. Because I. <laughs> will never know enough to say that I know enough and uh, I'm also like Susan a huge ally and a huge accessibility advocate um, and I like to I like the thought of the design for all mentality um, you're not designing for the web you're not designing for a web browser you're not designing for this you're designing for everyone and everything so I'm a huge supporter of that mentality um, random note that I just thought of on the slides is if you do hit the slides, we have tried to add in relevant information in the speaker notes so that anyone who is visually impaired or needs accessibility usage can check the speaker notes for all content, and there is extra content in some of the slides as well. So, getting started. Oh, we won't be speaking in iambic pentameter. I know that may have been a draw <laughs> for you. If you saw the summary, that's not a thing. Yeah, nor the, nor, no costumes either. No costumes, <laughs> yes. She mentioned costumes. I was like, that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna put it. So, um, speaker note version of our talk. Uh, area is simpler than it looks, and often can be skipped entirely. Um, raise your hand right quick if you were trained prior to 2012 on accessibility in HTML. Right, okay, so all of your knowledge is 100% deprecated and nobody told you about that. Which really threw the two of us for a loop yeah. when we were trying to do area labeling, which is how this talk evolved. So if you raise your hand if you have heard of semantic HTML. So you have been trained on the new way to do accessibility for like 80% of it. We didn't know that either. So accessibility is new, sort of, on the way they do it. Do it, um, And we're going to go through some of the broader examples here. Um, Yeah, just a few things we're going to go through. You know, just the purpose of area labeling. Uh, we're going to talk about HTML attributes for a little bit. Then we'll dive into the rules. Uh, again, just providing cursory overviews. Uh, we actually talked about uh, pulling in a bunch of code samples, but we found so much already out there that we just opted to link to them rather than go to, to the time of actually recreating them, because why? Um, so yeah, you'll find lots of links through, sprinkled throughout our slides that um, should be useful. And we're also going to be talking about RL, ARIA relationships. So. Yep. So as Susan mentioned on the Code examples, we, when we started this, we were going to make a GitHub rep repository and have a whole bunch of examples of here's what to do for all of these things. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So instead, that work was already done by W3.org. So we provided a link on, on this slide right here. Uh, each one of these is represented with example code of perfect, perfectly generated area accessible WAI uh, accessible code for each of the things. So we've got accordions, alerts, uh, messages, feeds, however you want to create, you can use these as a cookie cutter recipe and then build your perfected code from there. Mm -hmm. So diving into the purpose, basically just add functionality to the accessibility on in those areas, as Charles was saying, where semantic HTML does not. That's the short of it. Um, We'll get into a description of like their characteristics of classes, how they relate to each other, and uh, objects as well as share similar characteristics. So, uh, Charles, you want to talk about? Uh, the DOM element of attributes. Okay, so when we were creating this presentation, um, Susan and I both ran into a situation that were confusing us because, uh, raise your hand if you're used to using class, class equals, right? Um, 
There's dozens of other attributes which most JavaScript developers are fully aware of and exploit and use. Um, tab functionality, you know, labeled as, all these different things that they've been trained in that work. Well, an HTML element is an object and it can have a lot of attributes. So we went ahead and added in the beginning of the presentation sort of an overview of the DOM elements and we took, um, we took the image off of the wiki page for the document, document object model, or the DOM, and then we kind of tweaked it a little bit to show you where the attributes start to really come into play for not just the DOM itself and the, was it, the DOM tree, um, but also the accessibility tree, which is built off of the DOM tree. So if you'll notice, the green items that we have on, the, on this picture are attribute properties, right? So source, alt, but then there's another one, there's a new one, area labeled by. So if you've got a figure element and you've got the fig caption, the fig caption can give the label for the figure, for the, for the image, for the, for the figure. And so that's where sort of some of the new elements that you may not be used to yet are kind of making a difference on the way you will be creating HTML. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, just to reiterate, Susan and I learned a lot <laughs> while creating this presentation. Mm -hmm. So we tried to make sure everything was 100% correct. We are not going to lie to you and say it is. <laughs> All right, so uh, in the last slide, I referenced the DOM tree. When you submit your content to the web, it also builds the accessibility tree off of the DOM tree. And so for JavaScript developers, it's like DOM tree, and then you alter it with JavaScript, and then that completed item then generates the accessibility tree. And so you can see here on this picture right here, we've got the attribute class, which everybody's sort of used to. That's an attribute we all are used to using. Class equals this. There's also some new attributes you see here. There's the role equals tab list, property equals area label, and so this one, just from the two words I said, you can tell that this example right here is a property reference to give definition to tabs, right? So for HTML tags. So role is tab list, property is area label. And that kind of helps label the subtabs. Did I get all that? Okay. <coughs> Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I'm covering what we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of described this did a little I? bit already. I did, didn't I? You did. Yay, mm -hmm. winning, yeah. <laughs> winning. Yes, sir. So is the accessibility tree, is that, um, is that a thing, like a technical thing? Or that is that a technical it, thing. It's not just a sort of construct you're using to describe No. So if, if, so for developers, uh, when you're doing your front-end development and you right-click inspect and you run an audit, um, when you do the right-click inspect and you can look at the JavaScript events, you can actually click a different tab and see the accessibility tree as well. So it is a real thing that if you went through your training prior to 2012, wasn't a thing. So. It's a thing, uh, and this is actually what this what this particular graphic is. And I provided the link to the graphic here if anybody wants to look it up, because uh, I found it online and it really visually sums up what I what I was trying to explain. Is so when you create your code in the HTML, right, and then you edit that code with some JavaScript, the final product is your DOM tree. That DOM tree actually does two things from that point. It creates the visual user interface for the visual users, but it also submits the accessibility tree to be used by assistive technology via an API. So if, yes sir? What does DOM stand for again? Document object model for the beginners and for me because I really hate it and forget it all the time, it's HTML. So. Basically, the, the document object model is you can use it for XML, XHTML. Paul, please help me here because you've got them. No, okay. <laughs> anyway, 
you can use it for multiple things, and it's basically a cross-platform language that you can use anywhere. Uh, that's why, to, get, to try not to get off topic, that's why a lot of the cross-platform apps right now, like Slack, are built using Chrome, because it's using the DOM technology, because it's, it's cross-system compatible equally. And so HTML is sort of the language that's inserted into the DOM and then rendered up. And so just for, for beginner purposes, for accessibility purposes, and for this lecture, just think of it as your web page, something.html. And so, and as you can see here, once you submit that HTML, <coughs> it sort of builds up this little render object, but there's no visuals, it's just data, right? It's this huge thing of data, like a JSON file, if, if you've seen a JSON file. And then it takes that and it says, okay, it's time to build the visual UI. And so it builds it. And then that's what you see on the web page. But at the same time, it's also building the accessibility tree. And so it's also building the non-visual UI. And that's why you know feed engines can pull stuff from your web page without ever seeing anything. It's because they don't necessarily need to. That's where the DOM comes into play. So the accessibility tree, that data is then sent to the whatever assistive technology you're using. Correct. So that's what's actually a render. Correct. Okay. So yeah, and, and, and that's where it's, it's kind of, it took me a little bit to sort of visualize, and I really like this graphic because the way it does it, is because it, it, you create the DOM, the DOM generates the accessibility tree, and then some other software like JAWS or even Chrome, like a headless Chrome or something like that, goes in, pings your accessibility tree and says, give me the data. It takes that data and loads it up and then creates their version of the browser. Is that, I mean, not to get off topic, but just one quick question, because I know we talked about this yesterday, because I think I was in the session with you. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how something like an Alexa would work, like a, an Amazon Echo? No, they would, actually, different model. they would actually pull in from different event handlers. They would pull directly from the DOM. Because the accessibility, the, the accessibility tree is a specific API for assistive technologies. Okay. So the, the Echo would go directly to the DOM and be like, hey, I need these four data points. Give me these endpoints. Or I'm updating them. Okay. Sorry, I apologize. I shouldn't answer your question. No, it's okay. So I can't see. I love that. Like, <laughs> this is new for us. Like, yeah, good There's thought. no. Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. Hold what? On. I'm going to maximize this and see if it gives us stuff to see. Oh, there you go. Right? <laughs> like, don't you love that Google totally changed this thing, like, just before our presentation, <laughs> so we're trying to learn this new thing? We can't actually see our slides here. We, all we can see is the All we can see is the presenter notes. You don't have a split screen here. They're in your head, right? <laughs> this is what you should always Did you miss the like... part at the beginning where, <laughs> like, yeah. So, but this just shows a few attribute examples uh, that you can use, like, you know, the um, roll on click on key down, uh, all samples of attributes that we've used. Um. Just pressure forward. Let's see. So with aria composition, we get roles element. Uh, we get roles properties and states. Um, Charles, you want to speak to that? I'll let you go. I gotta take it. Oh, <laughs> come soon. Sorry. Okay. So role is just basically what's the role of the target element, like a tab. Uh, what properties uh, does the target element provide and can contain? Uh, and of course, the functional state of the target element is going to be open, closed, hidden. Uh, those are all different. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no worries. Okay. Right. So, so the role is the first element. You remember a few slides ago when I showed you all those new items? One of the one of them that you may or may not have used. Uh, Hold on, we forgot to say the thing about what error thing? rule one. Okay, so. Well, we're getting to that. Right, but these can get confusing. So, okay. remember what I said about if you can learn semantic HTML, you learn a lot of what you need to know. So, most of these roles are automatic with HTML5 code. So, if you use an H1, it's going to automatically know and build the accessibility tree with role equals header. Okay? If you use a aside, right? It would, I think it's role equals content? Complementary. Yeah, thank you. 
So it automatically assigns some of it via the semantic HTML. But sometimes you need to change it. So role equals complementary, role equals navigation, right? So, and actually that one you shouldn't change unless you're doing like div role equals navigation because this div is a nav bar, but you're not using the nav HTML. So, does that make sense? Oh, wait a minute, I did. Did you see that? On slide 18, yeah. like, I'm like, hey, this is a thing. Don't yeah. get concerned. <laughs> so properties. Go for it. So with properties, um, so when Charles and I were talking about this the other day, it's like, how do you explain this? Okay, so many of us have like a drawer in our kitchen that we just put random stuff in. We call that what? The junk drawer, mm -hmm. right? Screwdrivers, pens, pencils, probably half of them broken and not working because nobody can be bothered to throw those away. Uh, so that label that we've assigned to that drawer is junk drawer. So if one of my kids pulls something out of that drawer and I step on it in the middle of the night later, I'm like, ugh, why is this stupid screwdriver from my junk drawer out here. So I recognize that as my junk drawer screwdriver. I've assigned it that label, that property to the screwdriver. If that helps. Okay. So next up are states. Dude, this is super tiny. <laughs> I know, right? Like we're having to squint like itty bitty small to see what our slides are. Right. What's the next thing that we're gonna talk about? Um, so states. Uh, this one is uh, an on-off switch, right? You have two states on a light switch, on and off. So if you have done JavaScript development, you probably have used states fairly often, especially for tabs and accordions and such. There's a lot of states available for usage for area labels as well, such as area disabled equals true. So, and again, Use the examples to create the, per, the correct code because a lot of these aren't self-explanatory when you're trying to read what the property or state might be. Whereas the example code's like, oh, that makes sense now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so rules. First rule of ARIA is actually no ARIA is better than bad ARIA. As Charles has said several times already, you can use the semantic HTML, do so. So. See, this is where we provided like all of the information on the slide. There's no speaker notes for the right. slide. It's all right there. It's all right there, yeah. Just step out, see so, it. yeah. It's all right. Principle one, role is a promise. Using a role without fulfilling that promise and roles, similar to making a place order button that abandons the order and induce the shopping back. Aria can both cloak and enhance, screen both power and danger, as we've discovered. Um, it enables authors to describe nearly any user interface component um, in ways that assistive technologies can reliably interpret, thus making those components accessible to assistive technology users, taking advantage of that accessibility gap. Okay, but you me. can accidentally override some of those, and you have to, so you have to tread carefully. You don't want to override existing accessibility semantics. That's what you got to watch out for. Okay. So as we said before, do not change native semantics unless you really have to. So I guess really the first rule is don't use RN. Yeah, the first rule is if you don't need a label, right? Okay. So for example, the, the area labeled by um, property we mentioned previously. If you don't need to label the element, don't label the element. Mm -hmm. If you don't need to declare a role, don't declare a role. And the second rule of area actually follows up on that and sort of expands it and clarifies that if you have already declared a role, don't override it. If semantic HTML has said this is a header, don't try and say it's a button because it's not. It might be a header inside of a button. That's okay. But the header itself should not be changed to a button because the way, and, and I tried to get a JAWS example and I really wanted to showcase this particular scenario because when you're using assistive technology like JAWS and you jump in and you say, give me the headers because I want to see, how, I want to navigate between the content, right? I'm going to close my eyes to, so I can describe it. Um, and I saw it live and it was amazing. Um, and it teaches you how it works. And so they say, give me the headers, and it gives you a list of the headers that you can navigate between. 
And so give me all the H1s. I want this item of content, which is the third H1. Give me the, the H2s from that H1. And so it gives you a, a tab list of each of those H2s. I want the third item of content. And so they have quickly navigated the content they want. But if you've changed them to buttons, H1 equals button, it's going to skip that header altogether because that's not a header anymore, it's a button. So when possible, do not override the native semantic HTML. Oh, I love this one. So, the, uh, yeah, but let me Google it for you. Okay, I get to click it now. I get to click it. So, yay, clicky things. Okay, so I'm going to click the link for the um, accessibility override semantic HTML. So the rule is do not override it unless you must. Now, whose first thing when they heard that was, okay, what situations must I? Right? If the rule is only do it when you absolutely have to, so where is a situation where you absolutely have to? So I'm going to use my favorite thing that actually Paul introduced me to of the let me Google it for you. Right? Let me Google that for you. Right? Accessibly overlies semantic HTML. When does this thing occur? And there is pretty much no scenario I can find. That's not to say it doesn't exist, but beginner's class, as it were, potentially intermediate, there is no scenario I could actually find in like a day of searching where you should override this, the natural semantic HTML. Okay, now that I've had my fun. Sorry, what was that? What about remediation? Charles, did you hear? Hold on. Say, say again? What about if you're like doing website and remediation? Trying to go back. Re remediation, like say there's an organization that's doing something wrong and for a certain amount of time until you can actually go back and fix it, you have to use a temporary fix. Maybe that you would override. I don't know. I'm just thinking on top of my head, so. But I don't believe you would override so much as just fix whatever bad HTML is yeah. there. Just yeah. Get back to the core of to the, the good HTML manual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're altering the HTML already to even try and patch it, just fix it. Just fix, just it. fix it. Yeah, yeah. and that's an error because you know, let's say they declared it, you know, h1 role equals button, and that's the way it is for them. If you don't fix it, then that page is unavailable for assistive technology the problem until it's fixed. Because I work for Charles mm -hmm. and. I'm new to the accessibility team, and we have thousands and thousands of pages that probably have issues like this. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a struggle. Because mm -hmm. we're finding that developers think they know what accessibility is, but when we get them in the room and talk to them about it, I ask them, what do you think accessibility is? Mm -hmm. it, it's never what, you know. Like I, I, mean, like I said at the beginning, <laughs> I was unaware just how outdated my knowledge was until Susan and I started, because we started this adventure long before we did, we, we submitted for the talk. I, I think Jana can tell you, we started like a year ago. And the more we started looking into modern accessibility, it's we're doing things wrong, even though we're doing what we were trained to do 10 years ago and eight years ago. And so, I mean, I think in your particular scenario, I might recommend like looking to see what they're doing repeatedly that's wrong and seeing if you can say, okay, give me this chunk, replace this chunk with that chunk and have corrected code. Just run through and fix itself. All right, sorry. Didn't mean to get off topic, y'all. <laughs> All right, so uh, Area uses the KISS principles. Um, keep it simple. So you do not want to try and, you know, as I've said a couple of times, you don't want to try and rewrite what's there. So I've actually got examples on the left of don't do this, and then Susan put together the examples on the right of do this. <laughs> and so you'll notice the one I kept going back to is the, the header button, header button. And you can see on the tab up here, I've got an H2, because this, this button should be an H2. It is a header, and it's going to be a header. It needs to be a header, but it's also a tab, right? In proper area, you would create your H2 and then put the div role equals tab inside of it. Similar, similarly, you would do H1, right, and then div role equals button if you want to do the button. But you've got a sort of example right here. I think the DTU is the old 
Is it the data term or data term? Yeah. Data definition. Definition. Yeah. yeah. Definition. That was an example that they provided us online, and I was like, "That's not a scenario we're going to use very often." Because <laughs> why wouldn't you just use uh, H three right there instead of the DT? But that is technically correct and will work for screen readers for JavaScript libraries that use DT as the accordion markup, which is not uncommon. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay, see? Definition list. Yeah. Again, I will not pretend to be an expert at this knowledge. <laughs> it was a learning endeavor. Okay. Ah, aha. We already got through that. Go for Pretty straightforward. All area controls must be usable with the keyboard. Is there anything more in the notes about that one? Uh, no. Actually, okay. that one's pretty... Pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, this one, there's a lot of background information. Yes, sir? So uh, I asked a question through Google on this, and my question was related to kind of this discussion here. And so this is kind of just where I'm trying to understand the threshold that, that we as developers or we as sort of policy enforcers are supposed to sort of carry with us you know, to meetings and whatnot. Um, when is, okay, and I'll give you an example, um, a mega menu. So there's parent items that you would tap through, and then there's child items. Right. How many is too many? And, and, and the same could go for a lot of these commands or these interactive controls. Um, you know, if we have like a typical you know, UI that has a lot of sub areas or sub links, are all those needing to be tagged, or is there some sort of skippable way? I mean, I mean, tech experience would be good for them as well. Technically, on your scenario, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say we want to shelve that one discussion more towards the end. But technically, on that one, technically, um, you could go full H1 to H6 if you're using like headers for your menu, um, as long as you, as long as it's still navigation and role identified enough to where an assistive technology reader can sort it, right? Because because the assistive technology grabs the list of headers and puts it in a drop down and lets them read through and select. And then it provides the next list that they can read through and select after they've made their selection. And then it provides the next list that they can read through and select. So you could have seven lists deep or 75 lists deep. Um, but from a user experience standpoint, I would not recommend that. So, uh, but we'll, we'll, let's pick that one back up further, further into the, uh, the Q&A at the end. Um, so third rule of area. We didn't get too far into this one because this one does kind of, it's more of a intermediate expert level knowledge base for if you're an actual backend developer, did I just hit the, no I didn't. If you're like an actual backend developer doing user interface actions, um, if you can do it with a mouse, you have to be able to replicate it with a keyboard. So for example, I saw uh, um, one sort of CAPTCHA that got popular and then disappeared. And I really think it disappeared because of this scenario I'm about to say. You have to click on the item and then drag it into the square almost like a child's block. I could not replicate that with a keyboard. So unless I was using a keyboard, I was unable to access that, con uh, unless I was using a mouse and visually seeing it, I was unable to access that content. And so when you're building for accessibility, you're not building for visual and blind, which is a, a common mistake and is very frustrating. You're building for all. You're designing for all. There's people who cannot use a mouse because they cannot hold it correctly. They must use a keyboard. There's people who can only use a mouse and sometimes cannot use a keyboard. There's people that are vision impaired and color impaired. And so things to keep in mind as you, as you move forward, especially help leveraging the assistance these rules can provide you, is there's many different assistive technologies, not just two. <clears throat> that just backs up what you said. Is an example. Yeah, practice. it's just the example. Again, H2, give roll tab, heading tab. Oh, I did that yeah. one again? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> it's okay. So, go ahead. I feel like we accidentally copied that and didn't edit the code. Yeah, probably so. That was probably a, our bad. We didn't put the right code in there. <laughs> like I said, we're not experts. Anyway. Um, okay. The I am not a robot tool is a great tool for checking against robots, but if a keyboard user cannot access your site through it, you're using the wrong CAPTCHA. All right, fourth rule. 
Please, please go for it. Again, do not use role presentation or are you hidden true on a visible, focusable element because then you've just hidden it. Yeah. Uh, if you're like us, this is new content, um, new things. So CSS visi visibility hidden, right? Or CSS hidden, that's where the area hidden equals true comes from. It's literally the exact same thing, only created in a different manner. So your CSS change can actually alter your accessibility tree. Keep that in mind. Uh, and so we provided some example code. Uh, so you can do your um, area hidden. And this is sort of a scenario where, so role equals presentation is items that have no context for the content, but are visually seen. Background image. Background image is the only thing that comes to mind for me, but I'm like super picky about, you know, your user experience should be the same for everybody. Whereas there are scenarios where I have seen people that are like, I'm going to provide six images and they're all contextually there and I don't want them loading first. And see, I wouldn't agree with that. But that is where you would use role equals presentation. Area hidden is the opposite one. You don't need it for screen readers. This one is one that pops up fairly often because icons. Does a screen reader really care that you're loading up an icon for a Facebook? when it's a hyperlinked Facebook. Not really. Yeah. This, this note says, this is still a work in progress by the organization, but all interactive elements must have an accessible area. Yeah, this is the fifth rule of area. Mm -hmm. um, and, all right, so this one sort of confused me a little bit when we were reading into it because it was there in 2012 and everybody's using it, but it's still technically a work in progress. But the basic rule for it is, as she said, <coughs> all interactive elements must have an accessible name. So again, with the headers giving definition, semantic HTML, if you declare a header and put content in it, the name is that content. Right? It is a header with that information. Um, and this is where we are not experts comes into play. Just want to predicate that. But we have put together some example code that you can see where this one on the left doesn't really have a useful name, especially for this form field right here. Whereas the one on the right, there is a username associated with the form field in the text field. So instead of being separate and sort of being next to each other table-wise, right, in the old method, it's instead all one piece. Does that make sense? This was one that it took both Susan and I a little bit to try and understand clearly um, because we both do more front-end development than back-end development. And this one really is more useful for back-end developers um, at first glance. Because semantic HTML covers it for us, for us front-end developers. <laughs> so what's the difference between label and label, the point of the four? Is that just the... Which one? It's if the input's not the association. Oh. Yeah. And the ID's further down, so you want to say which one. Oh, yeah. So you can see, so this label is for you name. And so when you call the text and data entry field of, of you name right here, it's going to print that for assistive technologies. And so if you have to have it in totally separate divs, that would be a way to, uh, to have it separated. And that's where the, the label by also comes in as well. Yes, sir? Is name used anywhere else other than foreign elements? Is name used anywhere else? So ARIA elements needing an accessible name, is it only in form elements where you're going to have the association? No. It's the only example I've seen in the W3 docs, but I was just curious. I don't know the answer to that question. Tell you what, if you can add it on the Google set of questions, I'll ask you. Um, and we will send out feedback once we can research the answer. Because <laughs> that seems like something we should know the answer to as well. Like that's and that's where this talk came from. Susan and I are trying to update our knowledge base, and it 
showcased that it very much needed an update. I was like, hey, Charles, what's up with this? Mm. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> All right, any other questions before we move on? Yes, no? All right. It's on you. Area relationships. Yeah. What do you mean that's on me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so going back again once more to the beginning of the talk, we are not experts. Uh, we dove into this one, the area relationships, as much as we could. And the more we tried to put together logical, clear, and concise instruction, the more I, we were like, okay, no, they need example code. And we provided the beginning. Because when it comes to area relationships, you have, a, and this is just four examples of the like seven available tags. Keep that in mind. Um, so you remember at the beginning we talked about the properties, the attributes, and the roles, correct? Uh, sorry, the, the, of the attributes you have the properties, the roles, and the states. So a property is something that sort of gives additional definition, right? Your name is a property on the person that is you, right? Your age is a property of the person that is you. Area labeled by gives a property to an element saying, this element is labeled somewhere else. If you go by the previous slide's example, you know, name four equals, that was, that's sort of where it comes in. And then the area label is for the actual element that comes up. Um, let me see if I can give you an example here. So area labeled by, and this, this was the closest example I could put together based on what W3 shows. Um, and for general developers, especially front end, this one's going to come in fairly often, where you have a group of content and you want that group of content to be associated with one item, right? This bucket of fruit, apples, oranges, yada, 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 is a bucket of fruit, right? And so you can see in this scenario here, I've got span ID equals our options. So I have given it the concrete ID of our options. And within that span is the title CMS options. And so when I go down here into this radial group, the radial group for the, for the, um, for the UL, for the list, the radial group is actually labeled by the ID our options. Okay, I did that correct. For some reason, I did not see the equal sign. I looked up there a second ago. It looked like bad code. Oh, yeah. I was like, really? Did I forgot bad code? <laughs> right? What? No. We already did that one on another slide. Yeah. And so every single one of these items in the radio list, when it goes into assistive technology, it's going to provide, here's a list of CMS options. That's the title. And then when they go into the actual drop-down list to select their items, each one of them you're going to know these are the CMS options. Ma'am. So, you know I'm in the same boat with you guys because we went down this train. So, mm -hmm. Susan, so in my research that precipitated you guys getting into this, this is where I struggled a little bit, where where you got into the no aria could be better than wrong. Mm -hmm. So, when I ran across this for, for Susan's example, it the, what I had read was actually recommending this was an example where you would not need to utilize role because the semantic markup of the UL and the LI was communicating what AT needed. So I'm, now I'm thinking that I missed that whole, is the label by the reason that we're now doing all of this other stuff versus just a UL, LI set. Because I got a little bit fuzzy on, I just wonder, I didn't mean to set you up, I didn't mean to, you know, at all, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I just wonder, because this is one of those that I was like, crap, are we okay? Um, in her example, they had used, I think, we'd use the parent but not the child. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so in her, for her, test. she went ahead, I said, look, I think your better option is to actually get the parent out because mm -hmm. you have good HTML already. Um, but it was easier to go ahead and incorporate the children for her and move along with the parent, you know, just flesh out the child um, instead. And so I just wondered if you'd run across this whole UL not. issue would come up. Okay. And, and this is... We can move on. I just wondered. I actually have the same, and I actually go ahead and submit that on as a, as a okay. question, um, because I had that exact same question scenario, mm -hmm. because one of the things I like to do for lists is like UL, and then H3, 
list title, you know, and the, the header, right. and then li, 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 li. So, you know, here's a list of items, there's a, there's a header, you know. So in that case, you may end up having to identify the role for the header. Correct. And that, and, and, as opposed to recreating radio group. Well, no, in, in, that one, in that one, it would still be role equals header. You, you, as, the header is one where you should do your best never to change the role ever. But my, I guess my point there is that you wouldn't have two roles in that scenario, what you just described. Your mm -hmm. role there would have to be H3. Correct. And then, but I'm just saying, and then you would just keep your ULs and your LIs. You wouldn't end up with role radio in that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, that, and that's... I feel you, though. It's, it's very, it's, it's hard to grasp. Yes. Um, and... Just for, for informational sake, and we just learned this like, what, two weeks ago on the WAI, they fully updated their website just recently. Yay. Oh, I don't know if you've seen it. That's really good. Um, actually, tell you what. No, it's okay. Keep going. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they fully updated their website. So actually, there's information to be found on there now. Anyway. Uh, so we went over labeled by, right, where you're labeling a group of content that is not the element that you're looking at. Area label is providing a label for a specific element. The best example I could find was the area label equals close, right? You have a button, that button has a label titled close. That's all it is. That was the best scenario I could find. Um, the other one here might be an image. If you're using like a, a it's within a figure, you know, figure, image fig caption and so the fig caption might have an id of something with content in it and then you're using the fig caption as a labeled by for your image please tell me we did not get that anyway move on <laughs> yeah i need to look at that one yeah. da, da, da. any questions on area label right quick so how would that close manifest itself <clears throat> either in a browser or in assistive technology? Um, you wouldn't see it in the browser on okay. the area label by. Because in a, in, a, in, a, in a, I guess I can't say a browser because technically they're all browsers. Uh, you would not see it in a visual browser. And this is, this is where going back to the first rule of no area is better than bad area, right? If you are changing the functionality and the way it works, you may not see that and probably won't see that visually. So your H1 visually is gonna load with whatever CSS is associated with H1. And so visually, yes, you have declared it as role equals button and it is useless for assistive technology. That's where you would want to be careful and make sure that you're using it correctly. Yes, sir. Maybe you, you, you hit on this and I missed it, but um, <clears throat> this particular like area, area label, uh, just to get a better grasp, how would that manifest on the user side with the accessible software? I mean, what, would you, what experience would that create? Okay, and I could be wrong on this, I'm trying to remember, because again, I saw, I'd, I've only seen the one live uses of JAWS correctly. I've tried to play in JAWS and do it and use it, but it does take configuration that I haven't been training fully. That's um, really good video, that's yes, that's I've got three videos that I've got on my little track that I want that I wanted to watch. Um, it brings it up and it will be image. It'll it'll say image, and then it will say the title. So labeled by so it's this, and so it will it will read off the content here as the title of here, as the, as the name of that item. And then it will go into the alt text and, you know, description this. Um, so it, it provides it verbally as a label, if that makes sense. So this image would be what it would announce. Hmm? This image is what it would announce. Correct. Which is why that's terrible. Again, example code is not always good. <laughs> that's why I looked at it and I'm like, did we do that? Because that's not. But yeah, so the, it, that, this is a separate item from alt text, though, right? Because for for example, I made I I stated verbally fig caption over span, and I would use a fig cap, you know figure image fig caption. The fig caption is the caption 
that maybe the author wanted associated with the image, right? So your alt text is um, two players playing baseball in this stadium um, f wearing jerseys for this team. That's your alt text to give a, a non-visual description of what is occurring in the image. Whereas the caption might be good old days with my son provided by the author. And so that's where you can, pr you know, you can provide the, the label using something else. Does that better answer the question? Okay. okay. Sorry. It's going to take a while for that. Yes, yeah. and, and, that's, and that's what I say. It's, it's going back to that first slide. There's a bunch of huge amounts of example code. And, they, and it's not just, here's tabs, use these. Here's four different kinds of potential tabs and example codes for each of the four. Here's six different kinds of accordions you might use and examples for each of those. Um, I think the alert box had seven. And it's fully area, 100% WCAG acceptable code that you can use as boilerplate code and compare what you have to correct it. So yeah, like where you're coming from, I had a similar situation where I had like hundreds that were wrong and I found what was, you know, this one's got 75, this one's got 20. So I looked at the 75, I compared it using the tabs we found and I fixed the code that was generating my tabs and they, all 75 of those were resolved because it was, you know, being generated from, from, a, from a theme template. And so using the boilerplate code, you can engineer a lot of fixes. Okay. And resources. Yay. Yay. So a lot of enabling is like self-learn. Um, we have a checklist that you can go through for WCAG and be like, hey, I need to do all of these things. It is a really great checklist that's been helping me. Um, Mozilla provided an excellent web farm for web accessibility, which also, if you'll notice, the slash AR, their link farm also includes augmented reality accessibility too. So if you're in the wrong class, because we did say this one was beginner, if you're in the wrong class and you're looking for like actual developer style um, augmented reality code fixes for accessibility, that link farm helps as well. Um, the area tabs, Simply Accessible provides a really great tutorial on where there's dangers in trying to use an area labeling as opposed to more simpler code. Um, that one was really interesting. And so you can use the area labeling or you can do it this other way. And if you do it this other way, here's the steps to take to make it 100% acceptable for assistive technology. Which is, I mean, half the problems we have with putting together this presentation is because everybody was just screening what was right. Mm -hmm. Gotta get them all? More resources. More resources. <clears throat> okay. Oh, wait a minute. That's funny, we forgot to delete that slide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Got a few questions. Got a few questions, okay. Um, so this was a potential resources slide that uh, Susan and I were using to help build the other slides. We forgot to delete it. But we'll leave it on there because it's there now. <laughs> All right, questions and discussion? We've got two sitting. Hold on. And they might have been asked. I just saw them in there. All right, so it was Steven's question. Um, and then I think Pat just put his in there too. So we all right. So Pat's question: Area f Rule Five: Accessible names are form elements. Okay. So that one we're going to research after, and I'll I'll tweet about it or something. If that's just another way of saying use names with your labels and inputs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But it well, sounds like it's saying it's interactive elements, which could be <laughs> buttons and other things as well. I mean, it says all elements, right? It says all interactive elements, mm -hmm. which is not just forms. Yeah, I mean, so for all interactive elements, it yeah, I think some of the examples we saw did like menu trees that got really neat. Yeah, where you where you have to like 
you know, c click item three and it opens a tree, and then you click item two and it opens a tree. That makes sense. So yeah. each of those should have defined unique names, so that it's it's the screen reader doesn't think that it's trying to re-render the same content it's already rendered. Um, let's see when when. All right, so the next question I've got here is when to not use role equals radio group for UL with a role equals radio for LI. Let's see. And they had a link that they said better described it. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Is that me? Who's it? On the when not to use roll equals radio. That's what I was just, you told me to put it in there. So I put okay, it. okay, that one. Okay. That was me anonymously. Okay. <laughs> but I linked to this because this is where when I told Susan mm -hmm. when I was trying to help her fix her issue in world space and I was like, hey, I happened upon this entire universe that said none is better than bad. Yes, none and, is better. And they than had it kind of halfway on, and it was specifically about ULs and LIs. And they were using it for menus and menu and children and all this other stuff, but it was surprising to me that you didn't have to use any of it and just have good HTML. Yes. And so that's why I was just a little bit fuzzy on the example you had because I was like, oh, wouldn't that just be a UL LI? Mm. Well, and that's where some of the glory in my in my mind of the semantic HTML comes in right. is if you use nav, right, then it automatically knows that this is a nav item and it's navigation, and so it's going to apply the assistive technology for navigation against it. Right. If you use H1, if you use a side, if you use HTML5 semantic HTML elements, semantic CSS, if you use the newer, more clear technology, you've removed the need to do a lot of tweaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems like a lot of this would affect page itself for the days of like HTML5, where it wasn't like these semantic terms, but it was different. So yeah, if, if you're if you're built on a on a foundation five comes to mind because it's Diptopia and it's pre HTML five. Um, I've done a lot of tweaking that I wouldn't have to necessarily because it's they're using divs instead of uh, navigation. They're using divs instead of sides or um, content or main or something like that. Buster, what up? So there's one thing, I guess, it's not so much a question, it's just um, an important thing that I think probably gets left out of a lot of accessibility talks, which is that if you want to actually play with this and see it for yourself, there's a big problem with JAWS and that not only is it proprietary, but it's also prohibitively expensive for a lot of organizations, and they have a clause in place that says that developers cannot use it for free. Um, uh, it's basically, it's a trap, basically. It makes it very, very difficult to actually play with these screen readers, but there's an alternative now that's been developed. It's NVDA. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah non-visual digital access or something. Now it's it, it's also NVIDIA's stock symbol, which is a little bit. Oh, um, bummer. Which which one? Um, it's not yeah, NV Access. That's it. Free and open source software, and this is the one that uh, I had a couple of visually impaired people point me to this when I was updating. Uh, my software for accessibility concerns. They said, if you want to see what we see and what we hear when we navigate your website, play with this. It's completely free and takes away a lot of those barriers to entry and lets you actually play with it. So. Thank you, Buster. If I had a cookie, you would get one like right now. I would give you like a cookie cake cookie. Like I would hand it to you and be like, this is awesome. So it would be win Windows only is probably why we haven't played with it. NVDA. NVDA yeah. is when so it works Microsoft Windows. You can download it to your PC. Oh, yeah, Windows only. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mac users just have to use the built in voiceover. Right. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. yeah. Virtual bots, too. Uh, there are people at uh, Access U that just run them on a, you know, virtual. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that being viable. Um, but that, uh, according, because um, what are they called? The people that do the wave tool, they do a yes. survey everywhere. Okay. And cool. NVIDIA is actually the top one. And, they call them just, actually, and there's just a lot of good videos through like Google. Uh, Google has a uh, accessibility. That 
uh, training on how to use NVIDIA, but also how to use uh, voice effectively so you're actually seeing things is properly. Has anybody here tried using JAWS with this? Can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned the devil, but yeah. I mean, I <laughs> but it, it doesn't even work with Firefox. Well, and that's that's sort of what I was saying at the beginning. Is I, is I I really tried to use Jaws d for the demo, See, that's and I the demo ran out before I yeah. understood enough to configure it correctly. That's another thing that I struggle with is because in our operation, over fifty five percent of our user base not only are they on Internet Explorer eleven or below, mm -hmm. they're also over the age of fifty. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're locked into this particular segment where we have to support IE. Mm -hmm. And also, we have to support JAWS because am I, I'm relatively new to accessibility, but I really find it really disturbing that this software costs as much as it does, and it literally moved, it taxes your system like to such a point where my work computer is almost inoperable sometimes, hmm. and it's like I feel powerless. And then I want to check out things like this, but then I hear NVDA is not as robust as JAWS. I don't know that I, for myself. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. but I now, does anybody else have any recommendations other than NVDA or JAWS? But I think Just out of curiosity. I think it should be free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought we had come across a chart showing which accessibility browser. Um, if you Google um, web aid screen reader survey yeah. number seven, it will bring you to the survey, and that is one of the things that they show. Yeah. Screen reader survey? Yeah. Screen reader survey number seven. <laughs> That's awesome. Number nine. Yeah. Wow. Primary screen reader. Hmm. There you go. And the table contents are the Yes, sir. Steven. Uh, along the lines of tools, and here we are at a Drupal camp. I'm curious what everyone's um, experience has been with the uh, the Drupal modules that are accessibility checkers. For me, it's been the same uh, situation as, as this gentleman's computer, where it'll shut down the site. There's so much configuration that you could, could overdo it. So you have to be very light in your touch. But I wonder if anyone has any uh, success stories from that, or is it something that's the most frustrating to everyone else as it is to me? I don't know that we'd have many in this room just because it, it was marked as a beginner's talk, and that's more. Um, like back-end developer debugger type approach. Um, I can definitely refer you to um, a couple of developers after the talk that might be able to answer those questions. Got one minute. Yes, sir, last question. Yeah, um, a lot of these accessibility tools are defined that they're geared towards like Windows and Mac users. Um, the reason why I ask is like I recently heard about uh, so it's more a Linux based. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm actually reading up on here. Uh, it was the accessibility program office of some microsystems. Wow. Hey, that's a useful tool. So to to confirm for the microphone, um, Orca is a Linux based screen reader tool um, that it looked like it, you, said it, you said it evolved out of Sun Microsystems? Yeah, it was started uh, by Sun Microsystems. So that's a pretty cool tool. Well, as we are at the end of the talk, do we have any comments or, or, or questions before we close up? All right. Uh, we would love your feedback. Susan and I, like, like, like we've said repeatedly, it's it's definitely um, a work in progress of trying to get the best information, the correct information. So any feedback, we would love to have it. Um, and thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Can we get slides? Uh, oh, these, no. She just raised it. Uh, <laughs> but yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Does everybody's come? So, Charles, since you're in the mix on can, are those all going to be a part of some, will they all get posted for everybody? Yeah, like, you know what I mean? Like camp wide? Um, with the recording? I don't know if the slides will get posted with the recordings, but I believe those who provide the slide links, it'll end up going into their summary oh, on the YouTube good. post. Okay, that's what so, I was guessing. Yeah, like, like Khan or something. Yeah, okay. um, so I believe so. But yeah, and 
all of these recordings are going to be up on YouTube, thanks to the amazing Kevin Thell, who just got a props before I hit the stop button. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.